evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Conversations event. My name is Ari, and I'm a producer here at ACME. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present and future, and also to any elders who may be present in the audience today. Well, as I've already said, welcome to tonight's special conversation co-presented with Free Play. Uh, Acme Conversations celebrates bold experimental ideas, discussion and debate around the moving image and its connections to the world in which we live, from politics and society to culture and art. Tonight, we explore experimental art games, playful collectives and communities and ethereal experiences. Tonight's event is being live streamed on YouTube, so we ask you to hold your questions until the end of the session where there'll be a brief Q&A. We ask you to wait until the microphone comes around so that way we can capture that on the stream. You'll also be able to catch up with this event, um, which will be permanently on the Acme YouTube channel as of tomorrow midday. So I would like to introduce you to tonight's amazing and expert panel of hosts that we have. Firstly, we have our host and moderator for the evening, Chad Toprak. Chad is an independent game designer, a curator and an academic, and the current director of Free Play Festival, Australia's longest running and largest independent games festival. He's best known for his curatorial work with Hover Garden, Melbourne's video game curatorial duo, and his more recent work on Contours, an annual exhibition that highlights emerging contemporary Australian games that sit at the fringes of the medium. In the past, Chad has worked on award-winning games, such as Turnover, the four-player multi-gravity steal the ball and run frenzy, Cartload of Fun, a two-player collaborative physical game designed for trams and trains, and um, Julcyon, the experimental leap motion and VR puzzle game for two. Please, a huge round of applause for our host and moderator for the night, Chad Toprak. And over to the international guests for the evening. First up, we have Aurea Harvey and Michael Salmon. Aurea Harvey and Michael Salmon met online in 1999 and collaborated for several years as Entropy 8 Zupa, creating sensuous, personal and political web-based artworks like Skin on Skin on Skin and the God Love Museum, and designing websites for various cli uh, clients. In 2002, they founded independent development studio Tale of Tales, with the purpose of exploring the artistic potential of video games. Between 2002 and 2015, um, Michael and Aurea released eight video games, including The Endless Forest, Luxurious Suburbia, and Sunset. All their works are unique explorations of the potential of the medium used by video games, often winning awards for originality while being attacked for nonconformism. The couple have now stopped producing commercial titles to focus on virtual reality and artistic uses of computer technology with new projects like Cathedral in the Clouds and Quicotery. Please, a round of applause for Aurea and Michael. <laughs> and finally tonight on our panel, we have Zareda Buter. Zareda is a playful cultural curator based in the Netherlands. She curates, initiates, consults and documents events focused on playful culture and games. Her work revolves around bringing people together for creation, inspiration and playfulness. She runs playful culture organisation Zoe, where she has curated projects such as Incubate Arcade and Screenshake Game Expo, showcasing a wide range of different game projects and artists throughout the years. She's also run several local game jams, such as Molly Jam, Playful Jam and A Beach Jam. She is co-founder of Playful Arts Festival in the Netherlands, which explores the intersection of interactive performing arts, visual art and playful design. She was worldwide executive director of the Global Game Jam until 2014 and founding board, board member of Global Game Jam Inc. In 2013, she received the European Women in Games Award for Achievement and Innovation. A round of applause, please, for Zareda Buter. Cool. I guess we start. Um, <laughs> one sec. Here we go. Great. Uh, hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is actually Free Play's first in-person um, event, so I'm super happy that you can make it. Hello to everyone at home watching us. Uh, very glad that you can make it as well. Um, Oh yeah, and for anyone that wants to join in on the conversation online, uh, the hashtag is hashtag AcmeConvos, with an S. Um, and uh, you're more than welcome to use the free play hashtag as well, hashtag free play 18. Um, super delighted to have uh, the three of you here tonight uh, and in Melbourne, yeah. welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're very thrilled to have you here. Um, so I, I kind of want to start by talking about um, games in general more broadly and then kind of start to talk a bit more about uh, 
things that are happening at the fringes, I guess. Um, for a lot of people, uh, especially people who are outside of the game development scene, um, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of people tend to think about games as these big blockbuster titles. Uh, that's kind of like people's perceptions, their kind of go-to thing. Um, and then we have, uh, in, in more recent years, uh, the rise of independent games. Uh, and then we had like an exciting wave of, of uh, movement and excitement uh, sometime between you know 2005 till maybe 2014 or 15. Uh, and then we, we kind of saw the independent games kind of uh, become more mainstream. Um, <clears throat> while all that was happening though, there was a lot of things that were happening at the fringes uh, that were kind of rejecting these traditional notions of games and game design, mm -hmm. um, breaking those conventions. Um, a lot of the time they were perhaps not very well received just because they were so different um, and, and you know, people's ideas of what games were uh, didn't quite fit with those projects. Um, and I feel like this year's free play uh, actually explores that and, and digs a bit deeper. So this year's uh, theme for free play is intersections. And uh, we're really interested in exploring uh, all of the interesting uh, uh, you know, nooks and avenues and sections where games meet and collide with uh, other art forms, other creative disciplines, and other uh, social and cultural uh, discussions. And so I feel like uh, for a very long time now, uh, all of you have been doing some really excellent and exciting things at those intersections. Mm -hmm. Um, so perhaps maybe we can start off by talking a bit about uh, Tale of Tales and um, kind of the, the motivations and, and inspirations behind uh, what you do and maybe how you got started and things like that as well. Okay. All right. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, I guess so. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that funny enough, I think that the reason that um, independent games became such a large to do or large thing. I wouldn't call it, never say it was mainstream exactly, but I mean, there's levels to it, but uh, I would say that the reason it became so big is because of the so-called fringes, because people knew that suddenly, or because of things like what Zoe was doing um, with game jams, global game jam, all that, that, that they could just pick up their computer and make something. And so it's like, that's, I think a unique thing um, to happen in media based artwork where there was no gatekeeper. There was just you, your machine, you put it out there and you find your community or group of people to work with or you know play with, whatever. So. And then there was a gatekeeper. And then there was a gatekeeper, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, I'm talking about like this sort of ideal you know, situation out there that, that happens, but yeah, then, there, then it gets more complicated from there, I think. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I feel like part of the reason as to why independent games became so big um, was because of those um, um, barriers of entry uh, uh, lowering because of, you know, um, all of these online platforms that kind of emerged and uh, tools became easier to use, they became free to use, and uh, all of a sudden people at home in their bedrooms were uh, starting to make games. Um, yeah, I think the tipping point came with there being more information available, though, you know, and more people talking about how things are done and and stuff like that. I mean, I don't, I never think that the tech, the technology hasn't changed that much. I mean, it, in in essence, I mean, yeah, things get harder, easier, or whatever. But it was more just that people had that, found that desire to do it and realized, hey, I can do that because my friend did it, or that guy did it, or I saw how this person did it, you know, and that kind of communication, which has always happened on the internet, I think. Uh, Mm. help the spread of things, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, around this time, um, we uh, start to get a lot more uh, events and exhibitions and just uh, curatorial uh, endeavors kind of rise and look at independent games. You know, um, we have uh, collectives and organizations like Kokoromi, or baby castles, or wild rumpers, mm -hmm. and festivals like free play, um, the playful arts festival, and all sorts of uh, other festivals around the world that started to emerge around the same time that we're kind of looking at and celebrating um, independent games. Mm -hmm. 
Um, like how, so how did it start for you, Zareda? I'm really curious. Um, I'm wondering uh, when you started to notice the, the rise of independent games and games that were doing something different. We both started together. We just discovered that uh, <laughs> with our interest in games in 2002, three. three. three yeah. um, and independent games didn't really exist yet in the form that we know them now. Um, in fact, I remember from those days that uh, there was this big to-do about the, the end of the bedroom programmer, because contrary to what you said, there were bedroom programmers. Mm -hmm. It's just at that point, I think PlayStation 2 and things came out, and suddenly the, the level of expectation of the quality of the game became so high that it became so expensive, and it was over. Um, and that's when we started, <laughs> strangely enough, yeah. simultaneously, more or less. And then we saw independent games sort of happen when broadband internet happened, mm. basically. Yeah. Mm. So why did you uh, end up <laughs> start with these games? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, I guess I, I showcased you first, actually. Yeah. You were my first showcase or exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, Which was crazy because we hadn't done anything yet. <laughs> no, actually, when I now look up the website and it's like, yeah, 2003. And yeah. I was like, wait, this was 2003. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I found you. I found you. I Somehow, made you. I yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. No, it was a really tiny thing yeah. that I did. It was an exhibition part of Digra Conference, actually. Uh, and I was actually interning and uh, um, got to put together an exhibition. And we had all ki actually all kinds of different things. So we had you, but we also had uh, sound. Uh, um, we have a, what's it called? Like an organization, studio, whatever, doing things with sound and in mm -hmm. making installations with sound. So we also had a sound installation there where like was like vibrating and, you, and then you went through a world. So actually, the things that we now consider maybe new or on the fringes were already happening also in 2003, but maybe framed differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so we already had a wide range of things going on there. And even even party, we also did like a party with video games and video game designers back in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, and actually then I... I stayed away from it for a while because I it didn't think that. So I'm a curator. So I, uh, these days, so I exhibit games and play. And back in back then, I was interning and I was just like dumped into the whole thing and I was like, oh, this is it's a bit scary and I just don't want to do this for anymore forever. <laughs> okay. Anymore, ever. <laughs> ever. Always. And then and then yeah, now here I am. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you came back. I came back, uh, but basically also because there, I was still interested in video games and computer games and games in general, uh, playing games myself, and then also seeing the industry in the Netherlands um, getting bigger, mm -hmm. uh, more companies coming, and then there was a couple of festivals going on. Like there was the Festival of Games, and it was more like they tried to be a conference and also show a little bit of games, but also do share like studios would be there. Um, they would bring over international guests. Um, this is 2005, six. Mm -hmm. um, so I got more and more involved also and see the organizational side of things. And um, then I also started teaching at the School of Arts and I was interested in games, but also in performance, uh, performance art and, the, and installation art. And uh, then I could share this with my students, and the students would make these beautiful interactive installations and interactive narratives and theater, and they put it all together. Um, so I got more, more and more interested in that as well. And then um, in 2008, I started working at the Dutch Game Garden, which is an incubation and business center for video games or for games that wants to help. Uh, there were a lot of educational institutes and they wanted to help these students get into the industry. Mm -hmm. And so I also witnessed uh, like students and independent games um, companies in the Netherlands starting up and then all these conferences and events worldwide. And that got also ins inspired me to do like showcases and, and start up this um, Dutch indie game showcase for the Netherlands called Indigo. And uh, I no longer work at this game, game garden, but it's still happening. So in, in June it will happen. And it also now has a, like, a more broader reach, trying to get more independent games from around the world to the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, so it started fr from there. Okay. 
had a question now. I've forgotten. Oh yeah. So I'm I'm really curious um, when, as a curator, um, when you're um, thinking about the types of games and artwork that you want to have uh, in your festival. Um, like, what are what are the things that you're looking for? Because uh, n you know, there's so many indie games now, uh, and I feel like as curious, we're perhaps interested in certain types of games and not really interested in in others. So I'm really curious, like, for the Playful Arts Festival, what kind of like what's the what's the taste? What are you what are you looking for when when you go out um, looking for projects to show? Well. It, that's a difficult question because like it's for it's different every time mm. also depends on the like what kind of exhibition I'm gonna put on or what like sometimes I exhibit I make an exhibition make an exhibition for a festival and they ask me to do it like in something that I not run but I run, so I do the exhibition for them and then I'm asking what, like what do you want to be exhibited or what kind of things do you want to show and then um, so it's context based and for Play for Arts Festival we always have a theme uh, so we, we start from the theme and then also have open calls and then see what's going to be um, okay. submi submitted mm -hmm. and I guess it's also this is probably bad curatorial stance but gut feeling <laughs> <laughs> isn't it always so <laughs> I think it has to be and then see what makes what what mixes like I always try to have like a range of things that mm -hmm. I show. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be like a commercial game. Like I did for <coughs> last Sorry. year, I did for Screen Shake in Belgium, and it was like okay, I want to have like a bit more triple A feeling kind of game, but okay. also like a game that is made in well, I don't know on the fringes, and then and then also have something in between, and also have an alternative controller game, and so I have like I make decisions based on like okay what goes well, what is like um, on the opposite side of that, and then see make a mix of that. Okay, have you ever um, put together an exhibition, or have you ever wanted to put together an exhibition where a lot of the the games that you show are so weird and experimental and different that um, a lot of the audience perhaps um, kind of don't really understand or relate to it like it's so distanced from games that that maybe people are like is this even a game oh dear have you yes, every time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no but like that also depends on who you think that is going to be your audience yeah, absolutely. because I always try to reach audience that actually or no that also depends but I try to reach audiences that don't play games necessarily mm. so every game is almost all, so already something like oh my god what's this and what's all the buttons what, what does this button do mm. I don't want to press anything because I think maybe something goes wrong so mm. it's a whole different kind of audience than an audience that ma that makes games themselves or that mm. um, that are like entrenched in this whole mm. uh, online world of games or so there's always you have always to think about what audience you want to yeah. do. So it's, that's also, yeah. yeah it's funny that you say that because we, we used to say we're making games for people who don't play games. That was sort of our stated goal for a long time. Was, and then we realized, yeah, but people who don't play games don't play games. I mean, but, you know, we would show them. <laughs> no, because we would have them We would have them be in events, like, you know, and, and people would come in and they'd be like, oh, wow, this is interesting. I'm going to show my, you know, daughter or something like this. And we're like, no, 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 you should try it try it and then they'd play and they'd play for a long time they'd get sucked in and they'd you know and then but then you would tell them oh you can download it and do this at home and everything and they'd be like oh no 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 I don't play games and we're like but you just did <laughs> you know? come on it's great you know yeah. and you enjoyed it come on admit it you enjoyed it you know but <laughs> so it was sort of but that was sort of the fun thing for us for the longest time like people like down to the point where we were Play testing our games with people who didn't even hardly know how to use their mouse, you know, and things mm -hmm. like this. Like they're just like, oh, I don't know what, what's going on, or like, or um, to to navigate in a in a world, or or they're using like a, a controller for the first time or something, and you're just like, no, 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 just press this. It's very simple. Just go forward, backward. So we would design with these things in mind, even and like, um, and that was that was pretty cool. Just because we wanted to sort of suck people into this. Uh, 
we, well, we, we felt like we were doing the, the work that needed to be done kind of to, to make um, games more popular. I mean, we felt like maybe nobody's ever played t paid any attention to these people who, you know, they might like it and they just don't know yet, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So we were just sort of experimenting with that. And it was always like that for us, I think. Yeah, because yeah, when we, sort of the early 2000s, I think that we shared a dream with like the entire games industry that games would be the medium of the new century. Yeah. We would replace all other media. Um, bigger than film. And, you know, bigger, bigger than, than film, bigger than cinema. Bigger than that, books, those are the things than... that people talked about <laughs> also in terms of business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were sort of on the artistic side of that, uh, believing that, that uh, sort of utopian idea um, because we saw the potential. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's kind of over now, a kind of utopian thinking about video games. I think it's, it's a, lot, a lot more niche now, a lot less open. And it has been, um, I think. I mean, I. I it's hard for us to tell. We're we like, because we are so. You know. <laughs> we got too close, and mm -hmm. that, now then we couldn't see anymore, like what was going on. So mm -hmm. it's like you were asking mm -hmm. us earlier, what's going on in, in video games? I mean, there's so much going on. There's, there's just no way. So to, like, much happening. You can't yeah. really answer that question. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's impossible. And this idea of the fringes, I don't know if there is a fringe anymore. I mean, honestly, I think it's like, we always felt like we were in between. Mm, we have that great mm, phrase in Dutch, mm. tussen twee stoelen, you're between, you fall between two chairs. You like are between two things all the time. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. You just always feel like you're between things. And we were always between things. And now we're, we sort of stepped out of that and we're, we can't even tell what's happening anymore. Mm. I mean, it's weird. I, I, so um, my thoughts, on what what uh, constitute fringes is that the whole idea of fringes is actually quite subjective. Mm -hmm. You know, for someone who's played um, AAA titles their whole life, um, these big big blockbuster video games, um, independent games are perhaps at the fringes. For people who are quite comfortable with independent games, perhaps the weird experimental stuff mm -hmm. are the, the fringy things. But for artists who are working in those in in, in that um, in that in that field or in that area, mm -hmm. um, the intersections are perhaps like other art forms and other media. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, it's to me it's about how we uh, kind of uh, you know draw that thread between all of those and and, and get people to oh, sorry to see what's happening in all of those worlds and, yeah. and perhaps uh, getting people to, to, to talk to each other as well. Yeah, perhaps that's it. But it seems like there's just so much, um, well, you know, going on that it's, it's really quite interesting now, but I feel like it's not just in games, but in all of the arts, and perhaps this is just my perception that now it's not so much about picking and choosing like, oh, I make games, oh, I make, video art or oh I do this you know type of artwork or I make film or it's now it's sort of like you can pick and choose like parts of you know mm -hmm. it's like you can make your film 360 mm -hmm. and interactive you can make your art installation in VR or you can like you know make a I don't know you can you know be a, a video artist who also enjoys like um, you know working with game engines or you know a game maker who wants to make an installation you know that with physical props and mm, things mm, you know what I mean mm. it's like so it, I feel like there's now just it's all kind of wide open Absolutely. on it when you look at the intersection and I wouldn't call that a fringe I'd say it's just that it's more of an attitude right now Absolutely. amongst people who make things that um, that you can um, feel free to like choose your medium and mix and match your medium to, totally. to your ability or to your desire or to your situation of, that you're making yeah. something for. Um, and I find that really fascinating right now. And Definitely. I think that's why we stopped making games because it was like, well, that's just one thing. It's yeah. like you can do, yeah. I mean, it bears saying that like when we started, um, we were actually not interested in video games at all, like in 2003 when we were making games. It's like you say, it's like you were, you well, had we the were, sound we installation. Were, we it's were, not entirely but... true. We were, and, and we thought we liked video games, and we liked all these <laughs> things about video games, and so we wanted to work with them. 
And then it, people started telling us, but you don't like video games because we like the wrong things in yeah, video games. Yeah, the wrong things. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we, so we weren't like, cool enough. We just wanted to play that shooter, but we don't want to shoot anything. <laughs> we just want to walk around in the world and like hang out and like go look at over that cliff. You put a lot of work into that. Mm. You know, we talked to game designers just like, or environment artists or whatever. We're just like, you put so much work into uh, that. Speaking of walking around, there's a <laughs> yeah. video that I wanted to play. Um, this is actually... Uh-uh. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, very blurry video of the graveyard. So, yeah. <laughs> this was my first um, exposure to a Tale of Tales game. I was in my first year uh, here at RMIT um, doing game design degree and uh, uh, in one of our lectures um, they showed this game and I, like looking at it, I, I was just super fascinated because it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Um, and you know the whole process of of the game is you play as this elderly person and you're walking through a graveyard, um, <laughs> and that's it. And that's it. And eventually you you reach a bench, and you sit down. Mm -hmm. It's like a little monologue, and then you walk up, and then you you walk your way back out. Yeah. Well, and, during the song, she may or may not die depending on the version of the game you're playing. Okay. And so it was sort of that was the idea was that. That's the game, in a sense. It's like, does she live through the song, or not, or does she die a natural death? It was sort of a comment on a bunch of different things at the time when we put this out in 2008. Um, it was also sort of the purest expression of every philosophical idea we had about games at that time. Uh, so we were trying to see if anyone else thought this was interesting, and that's why we released it. Mm. And we expected people to just either ignore it or, you know, whatever. We didn't expect it to be. I mean, we didn't have any expectation, I guess. Mm -hmm. We just want, it was an experiment to see what would happen if we said, hey, we've made a game and then put this out and see, and yeah. So <laughs> out, of, out of curiosity, what, what were people's reactions to it? Um, <laughs> Michael? I mean, the, 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 yeah, the, the, I mean, at this point, I think, I don't know if we expected it at that point, but at this point, is the usual, you know, this is not a game, where's the zombies, um, yeah. I want to have a story, uh, those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, Several fan games were made, right? <laughs> like sort of uh, like people, kids uh, oh, making versions that. of the game that like just to make fun of it, but like at the same time they turned out to re being really great fan art, like... Um, yeah, one was called The Gutter or something. It was like a drunk guy trying to get down the street. There was another uh, one. And, and it was really was intended like, as criticism because we met the yeah, designer. Yeah, start playing music. And he was sort of almost uh, <laughs> like <laughs> nervous because he thought we would be offended. But we thought it we was thought really it was great. funny. We were like, this is actually really great. This is exactly what we're talking about right here, you know. Um, so that happened a lot. And like, um, but it was sort of, we, we made this game during the time that we were working on our other game, The Path, and um, we needed to stop making The Path for a minute because we were, had been working on it for a year and a half and we thought we would never finish it. And we were like, we'd really just need to do something else for mm. a little while. Mm. So we made this game very quickly. It was also sort of experimenting with um, what we could do with a different game engine and um, this aesthetic and I mean, the look of it. We were always sort of trying to achieve this very high polished look, but we knew that we weren't that good, if you know what I mean. Like, that we could never make, you know, Assassin's Creed or whatever, you know, these sort of very high ended AAA games. Mm -hmm. But people were always comparing what we did at the time because we were using 3D and um, a lot of independent games sort of stuck to 2D side scrolling kind of uh, looks. And we really went all in with 3D um, and game engines and stuff. And so we got compared to a lot of things that were really out of our league. We're like, no, we made this for like, you know, 200 bucks in a weekend. No, this is not true in this case. But it was like, you know what I mean? It was like this sort of comparison. And um, so we were always sort of playing with this as well. People's expectations of things that look like this, I guess, um, at the time was very but, but the way that games looked was one of the things that attracted us. Yeah, I mean, we're, that's we're, what we were attracted we, to. We're very yeah. fond of, of um, sort of uh, figurative art from sort of before the modern age. And so we saw video games as this kind of a continuation of a visual language yeah. That that you know people in the art world would probably consider old-fashioned, but but that we like. But a in lot. video games, it was like the <laughs> vanguard of everything. Like, let's make this character look more re recognizable, more realistic. Mm -hmm. Let's have the leaves moving in the wind. Let's have you know, 
and um, so how could we do this was always our question. And um, I think that was part of the reason people even looked at it, was they were like, oh, this looks interesting. And then they start playing, and they're like, huh, scratching their head. And then either their reaction was very childish and angry, or they sort of thought about it and either put it aside or wrote us nice emails. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. We got a lot of nice emails about pe from people saying, oh, this reminded me of my grandmother, and it made me very sad, and you know, she died in this. We got a lot of nice stories about like, um, and that was what we were trying to trigger also was this sort of emotional effect. It's like mm -hmm. the game happening inside of people rather than happening on the screen. And we didn't care that you played it for five minutes. In fact, in this case, it would be hard to play it for longer, you know, um, and all of our games were like that. Um, now that's not such an odd idea, but at the time, a game that was only gonna take like, you know, a few minutes, you know, it was very strange because people were used to RPGs that lasted 20 hours, you know, and stuff like this. And, so the idea of something short and simple and just this is what it is and it's nothing else was something that we thought was an interesting way to get people to play rather than feeling like it was hard and involved and you know um for kids or something like we really wanted it to be um yeah something else and we didn't mm. quite know what that was even mm. <laughs> most of the time do you do you feel like the art world um, has paid attention to the things you make because you like the you know your background your interests uh, are also deeply rooted in traditional arts and analog arts mm -hmm. um, is is that you, like is there any attempt to try and bridge both worlds from us we've or? actually rejected that a little bit yeah. ourselves okay. because I mean we come from we come from cyberspace we, we started this this whole adventure with working with uh, uh, digital media when the web began in the <coughs> mid 90s and for us this was sort of a liberation from conventional uh, brick and mortar <laughs> art world because we could make our, our art we could show it to people we could do all these things digitally uh, online and games were a continuation of that so we kind of always insisted that we make software, mm. software art, mm. and it was di distributed the way that software is distributed. And we saw the, the exhibitions that we did um, as sort of promotion, not really as a way to show the work, but sort of like to point, to, to, to tell people that it exists, and but they should play at home. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. they were also made for that. They were made, designed to be very intimate, private experiences. Yeah. So it's a bit our fault that there hasn't been a lot of Connection. Oh, but at the same time, because of the experiences we had with the internet and um, seeing art world interest in uh, in digital media in general, see it come and go, see it sort of rise and fall and change and all this, and we were just like, yeah, well, they're kind of fickle. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. we weren't interested in being anybody's flavor of the month or anything. You know, it's like, it, that's never been our interest. And we didn't see how... Um, we could make money out of it anyway, other than selling software, which was interesting to us for the aspect of, it, it, you know, when we first wanted to make video games, it was like, oh, well, this is interactive art, you know, which is something that we had always made, like our whole lives, we've been making artwork with computers in one way or another, like not always in this way. Mm. Um, and it's just, it made so much sense. It was like, well, we could just sell our work and people are playing with our artwork and that's really super interesting. Like, that's just something that's hardly ever happens. I mean, you know, and, and, and um, that was exciting to us. Um, so we didn't have an interest in, in, in the art world, whatever that is anyway. I mean, but, and, and then the, the art interest from arts organizations or museums or galleries or whatever, it comes and goes. I mean, you know, and it's it's also of interest, but for other reasons, for that idea that we wanted to um, make work for people who hadn't played games, we want them to see it. So, you know, we would do, we had our, like, a retrospective of our games at a museum in Mexico City, for example, and that was so exciting and, like, really interesting. It was, like, all just the public or, you know, coming in and playing and, like, and, and seeing what we did and um, talking. I don't know. It, so we were interested in those encounters more than we were interested in the context. Right. If you know what I mean. Yeah. So um, we've done a lot it's of It's also that. a bit problematic <laughs> in, in terms of um, contemporary art that would, because in general, the, the kind of old art that we're interested in is also rejected that. And there's a whole stream of more traditional artists who are also fighting <laughs> sort of against this, this the, the, the modernism, Absolutely. basically. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, like figurative painting is coming up again, uh, sculpting, all those things are, are on the rise too. But they have trouble. 
being accepted by sort of the mainstream contemporary art. Yeah. So it wouldn't even be easy for us. <laughs> Actually, in some extent, it's easier because video games just are kind of, you know, sexy <laughs> for a yeah. contemporary yeah. Art so, context. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always really satisfying to see video games in museums, especially when they're not in a video games context. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I was at the Ian Potter Museum a um, couple of months ago, and it was such a delight to come across uh, the path yeah. in that exhibition. It was an exhibition around uh, fairy tales. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and yeah, the path was in it. And I, I find that to be quite yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, see, we always loved that. Like, we, we always wanted to have our games, not only our own, <clears> but <throat> others um, seen in these sorts of mixed contexts mm. because we mm. felt like, well, why is it always just this one mm. way of presenting or or um, talking about uh, seeing video games within culture, you know, and um, I think that's why we've made such diverse types of games mm -hmm. also, and with with characters that up till, you know, a few years ago were seen as very strange characters to have in a game, making a game with, with six girls in it. Like, mm -hmm. that's just, th at the time in 2009, that was strange, you know, um, and um, yeah, it's like, well, why not? It was what we were always saying about everything. <laughs> like, well, why not? Why is, why is games like this? Why are, in fact, we started making games. It was, we were just full of questions, mm. a million questions that we couldn't answer and no one had an answer for. And we're just like, well, yeah, we thought everybody was stupid. Like, why do you always make <laughs> Why is it going to be like this? Why is it always like this? You know, and, and there was really no answer to that other than pe people were making what they liked. That's what we ultimately had to accept. And when we realized that, we're like, oh, you like this stuff. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. No, 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 it's good. You know, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> you like race games you like shooting stuff okay okay cool so we make what we like you yeah. know and that's what everyone is doing i hope totally. um, <laughs> so yeah um Zareda, i'm really curious uh with your playful arts festival which is coming up really soon um you you kind of pose the festival not really as a a games festival even though there's a bunch of games in there um, you you kind of pitch it more as a, a playful arts where you have um, multiple um, media and disciplines kind of merging in, into one. Um, can you can you can you tell us a bit more about that and like why you feel like it's important that all of these different art forms get to, uh, come together for a, a celebration of playfulness? I guess. Yes. Um, so I do it together with a colleague, um, Iris Peters, and she's also from the Netherlands, and she comes from a visual arts background, and I come from interest in games, video games. And then we met each other in like tw 2011, and she, they were doing a game exhibition, or yeah, an exhibition for uh, six weeks in different galleries. In, uh, in a town in the Netherlands. And uh, so also Tale of Tales was shown there and a couple of others, yeah. <laughs> um, and then we thought, and I was doing a, a small game jam for them. And then we were like, oh, maybe we can bring more of these worlds together also. And also what I was just saying about, uh, that I was teaching at the Utrecht School of Arts where the, the students were making all these different installations and make, doing crossovers between theater and, and games. And so it, it's called, it was called Design for Virtual Theater and Games back then. Um, so a lot of my interest also brought into like more installation art. Um, and my colleague uh, as well, and she was interested in the playfulness and in, 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 in games. And then we decided, okay, we can do something about this. Let's make a festival. Mm. I'm a little bit distracted by the video sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at it. <laughs> See what's happening. Um, what was your question about it again? I've kind of forgotten. But it's, I mean, it's, it's really great to see all of these um, installation games and performance arts kind of being... Um, shown alongside games, I feel like that's something uh, that needs to happen a lot more, I feel. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. This is a yeah. strapping video, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool video. I'm just like watching it and <laughs> just fascinated by all the different types of things that are happening. Yeah, um, but I mean, this is what I meant. Like, it's like, it's not just one thing. It's, it's sort of like, if anything, video games today, fringes are not, uh, you know, uh, independent games are thinking more like this, like where it's not just you know, a screen thing all the time, necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be that, but it can also be this. It can also be about human participation in a physical space. It could be, I mean, I don't know, and I think that's super interesting. Or it can be, you know, an artist who's really t using um, th sort of the, 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 fo the form of game, uh, of, of game making or something um, to, to enhance their work. And I think that this is, um, I don't know, the way forward, I guess, absolutely, uh, for absolutely. independent games. I, I, especially since, I mean, we could get into this whole thing, which we'll probably talk about during a keynote, about how, like, um, the idea of making and selling games is kind of over. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, this is not what most independent game developers are in it for. Um, perhaps that's still true of the larger commercial video game scene, but I think most independent game developers I know are really making it for the the community aspects or for um, for the idea of it being an artwork. Even I mean, it's like I know so many like artists who are you know making their work with game engines or make with sort of technologies or concepts of games, but it's not necessarily meant to be seen as a game. You know what I mean? And I think that this is what has happened. Like the independent game scene sort of spawned this idea that that video games can be um, hybridized or um, it's, it's another medium or something. Okay, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I feel unwell. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I didn't know it was okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. yeah, so I guess if you look at the, at the video, it's also about people playing right yep. yeah so i guess video games are played by people and mm -hmm. uh, we really want to have um bringing people together to play and so it's also called the playful arts festival because we really want people to play together and then experience things with each other and uh, not necessarily solo so our first um theme was collaborative play and so we had a couple of um video games, uh, physical games, and different kinds of games that actually made people play together. Mm. And then that's all, that stays like a, a red line, a red thing, thread through yeah. our festival that we really want to bring people together um, because we feel that's, that's important. And then this year the theme is the here and now because we really want people to focus on the moment with, with each other. Um, so throughout the year we do a couple of those things and this is the festival about sessions and the the encounter is is the theme was the theme of this evening where we brought two different artists uh, or collectives together and they had an hour to do their own thing and then we had dinner together with the audience as well and then after that do the other um, um, the other performance and then have uh, a conversations of conversation with the artist and the audience together so that they could get get more in-depth details about what they just experienced and talk about it and be and reflect on that um, and this is also like this this was was a theater group and then the other was a, a dance group and they did both things that brought people together or made people encounter each other in a different way so this was a really playful way like to make you feel like you're part of a festival and there's two people <laughs> that are that are blindfolded and they are then part of the festival experience but they don't know what they get themselves into yeah. so they're and then all of a sudden they they feel bodies next to each other and like um play and these and they get assignments by these uh cards and then yeah so there was a certain kind of encounter and then the next one was uh a dance group that did dance the dance performance together with us And it was all about distance and how you perceive distance and how you perceive each other from a different distance. Um, so this was 25 feet. And we just, it's uh, so fascinating. It's, <laughs> it's really cool. It's really cool. Yeah. I, I, I really love everything you do, Zarita. It's great. It, um, it, it shows that games 
and playful media don't exist in a, in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, you know, uh, having not only uh, game designers and, and people who are in the game sphere, but also people outside of that, people from the general public, um, look at games and, and look at this and think, oh, wow, games are like way bigger and broader than I had ever uh, yeah. expected them to be. Yeah, and there's many, what we also n notice is that there's many people um, thinking about games or uh, putting games into their work somehow, mm -hmm. or, or game thinking, if you want to call it like that. Um, but they never come together, so they don't know, but they might want to know or hear from each other. So some, we had this dance, um, dance group you saw in the earlier video, and they wanted to have more try to get more involvement from the audience and the people that were surrounding them because they really want to have participation of the from the audience and they really didn't know how and they thought maybe if we talk to like a game designer so they came to us so if we could connect them to a game designer because we know both worlds right and um and that's also something we'd like to do to make people make the artists aware of these different worlds and bring them then together uh, with for the with the festival no, I find that super interesting, actually. I mean, really, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's like what, what we're doing um, now more and more is that we're, since we aren't really just making software anymore, like we're, we're working, uh, trying to work on sort of themes that or with co groups that we find interesting who perhaps hadn't thought about like translating the whatever it is into a digital medium. So we're working with them. Um, this, uh, the theater plays of Thaddeus Counter, for example, mm -hmm. that's one of our projects right now, is mm -hmm. we're making a VR theater uh, work uh, called Cricotri. Uh, and that inf kind of involved, uh, it's got started with a residency that we did in, um, in um, a little town called Hushisko in, in Poland, which is right outside of, um, outside Krakow. And, um, yeah, it's hard to explain like exactly what, what, what the project is, but it, the, the idea is Talius Kanter is a theater maker who is quite famous in Poland, and um, they wanted us to just come up with a project, and so we decided to make sort of a, a, a tribute to Talius Kanter's theater. Now, I don't know if you know what his theater plays are like, I could show you pictures, but they're a little bit like, it's, it's sort of this theater of death, they call it even, like it's just this very depressing post-war, War II, like, um, very serious, serious theater, um, and we were like, well, yeah, but we saw this like very inspirational stuff in it, so we decided to make this sort of recreation using his characters. His characters uh, appealed to us in in that they um, we, we we sort of always wondered like he uses a lot of dolls and humans and like uh, on the stage together, and we were like, yeah, well, when you're in, we're doing make something in 3D. It's like there's no difference between something that's alive and something that's dead anyway. So we just felt like, let's make this thing. And so it turned into this very playful like, and very strange um, VR experience that we showed in a house in the woods in Poland. And there was mainly like people came there and like were experiencing VR for the first time in this very, very beautiful setting because it was in this sort of in the countryside. But it was like this strange, very weird encounter, I guess, you know, between um, something that was a physical theater made into this VR experience that people felt like they were experiencing. And then, um, I don't know, just the physicality of people being in the room and one person being immersed and like what's going on. And I don't know, it was our first time really doing something like that because we were so used to this idea of things being on a screen, like Michael said, we, we are software makers, you know, and not um, installation makers, you know, but all of a sudden we realized this physical space thing is like the most important part of what's going to happen now in a way. And like, and it has become for us as well, our other project, Cathedral in the Clouds involves like this whole construction and projection and, I don't know, I just think all of these things are really super interesting when you start getting into this physical space, when you start bringing in, um, I don't know, other, t other art forms, mm -hmm. like, and mm -hmm. taking them seriously and bringing it into the game space or taking games and taking games seriously and putting them into, uh, or hybridizing it somehow with um, other art forms. You get something completely new and something totally interesting. And it seems to me like that's where 
I don't know if that is answering I, your question where things are absolutely. going or where yeah. the fringes are. Yeah. But it's not the fringe. It's a hybrid. It's mm. a, it's mm. um, yeah, it's a way forward, I guess, that uh, I think a lot of independent um, developers are interested in um, also. I feel like a lot of the projects involve some sort of um, like spectacle almost. Yeah. A lot of the things um, that we're seeing on the screen are quite performative. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that you, Zareda, um, kind of look out for when you yeah. when you're looking for for things to include in the festival, like things that are not only interesting for the player, but also interesting to watch as a as as a spectator or as the audience. Yeah, definitely. We also want people because seeing is doing often. Like with video games, part of the problem is that if there if no one is doing it nothing is happening right? or problem it's like that's the that's the idea you play video games and if you don't then the screen is just there yeah. and you can look at pretty pictures um, and then for a lot of people it's all also if they don't play games then they not necessarily go to the thing to play it mm -hmm. uh, with exhibitions um, people will like stay back and watch other people play and then maybe f see it's interesting and then they will participate yeah. um, and then it's all it's always about the invitation and if an invitation with video games is often you know that you have to play it and then you know what all these keys do yeah mm -hmm. um, so that's also why I look for like alternative controllers or alternative ways to participate um, but what we do feel with the Play for Arts Festival is that we really want people to enjoy playing or and not make a spectacle of them, mm. but that they are that they enjoy doing it and being there. And so it's a often a very intimate but um, kind environment that we try to put them in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and then it gets a performative mode, but not in a yeah, not in a spectacle way that they don't feel like they yeah. So often it's like like for example we had uh, Spotter, which is a a dance game kinda, and it was in a previous uh, um, video, and it, it's just like it's a Kinect, and it registers your moves, and you uh -huh. get, there is a mirror in front of you, and you see yourself doing all these uh, moves. Um, and then in the background, there is all there is like it can be wings or it can be like different kinds of particles or whatever that they're doing. Uh, but it was really interesting to see that even the most shy people were going on stage mm -hmm. on this yeah. little little high elevated uh, stage um, to do it because they were like, oh, this is so nice to be able to dance. And then they were just in their in their own little. A little environment because they could see themselves and then experiment, and so it became a performance, but not necessarily. Per, um, yeah, not. They were enjoying enjoying the fact that they were doing that, and uh, so it invited other people to do this as well. So that's really important to us that it in, invites invites people to participate. Yeah. Um, another thing that I. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so you're you're also really good at um, documenting and archiving a lot of the things that happen in Europe and around the world. Um, you have a whole website dedicated to it. Uh, can you talk a bit about that and why it's important to you that a lot of that's kind of documented and and archived? Because like a lot of the things that happen, especially in these, you know, one-off events or festivals is is very um, you know it it happens and then it's gone you know there, it's like a very it's a one one evening event kind of thing and, mm -hmm. and then um, perhaps it's just forgotten about yeah, I know I wouldn't have remembered that we did that thing together in 2003 <laughs> at all <laughs> like, so I'm glad somebody remembers yeah, I still have some pictures I think yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I want to see them. <laughs> so yeah, why why do you why do you feel like that's well because she's like you said it's 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 gone right but I think history is is kind of important because if you want to like reinvent something for example then you know you have to know what came before that 
Um, also, we are like super lucky that we that our medium in this case video games is super young mm. still. Mm. So uh, even with even film is rather young. So there is yeah. like the 1900s. Uh, there is maybe st no well there won't be people alive from the hundreds but like there is still also a young medium so we still have a lot of things available to us from that period mm -hmm. and uh, video games is like since the 60s um, and I feel that it's uh, good to know about this history so that we um, can um, you know be aware of, of things that came before and then build on mm -hmm. on it it is important, I think, because it seems like video games, uh, it's got a short memory or something, or, mm. or, or I guess that video games have been treated like an ephemeral product so much, um, and that this has been kind of a shame. Like, you know, people have games libraries with like, you know, 100, 200 games in it, and they haven't played like, you know, a quarter of that. And, um, so it's nice when there is an opportunity to archive something or to remember it as being important uh, that it that it can happen. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've often felt like that's kind of I don't know what the solution to that was or is, mm -hmm. but I think it's sort of led to an yeah. impasse kind of uh, the games software uh, thing instead of games as I don't know seeing games as something more precious or interesting or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the solution is to that idea uh, at all. But yeah, I think people are, are working in different kinds about documenting stuff. But I also I noticed like uh, back in 2003, three, five, whatever, that there was always these events going on, but then no one was like taking pictures. I was like, mm -hmm. why is no one taking pictures? It's important. I feel it's important for some reason that, yeah. that, that people are aware of that or that you can look back and then see this happen and uh, then also incorporate maybe mm -hmm. some of that um, into the, their own work. I mm -hmm. mean, without, yeah. without uh, other art forms, there will, ha won't be video games, for example, or the way around. Like, what will happen uh, when there's lots more video games out there? Then yeah. um, we should not forget. <laughs> something yeah i don't know cool um i think we might now open it up to the audience for questions um does anyone have any questions for the panel uh, hi um i was just wondering if you have any um tips or like experiences you can relate from trying to find audiences that don't identify as um playing games themselves and like from your experience of like, because I guess you, you, you're often trying to find that kind of audience. So I'm just wondering if you have any things you'd like to share about how you find an audience like that. Usually if you make it, they'll come <laughs> kind of, <laughs> yeah, in a way. I mean, yeah. How do we find an audience for, for games in general? Maybe this is more of a question for you, because we, we've never really been that concerned about like who's playing. It's like we just put it out there and close our eyes. <laughs> and, like, and, uh, and usually uh, someone finds it, <laughs> for better or for worse. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, send it yeah. into a lot of things, right? So to like, Free play had submissions, right? So that, and then the and jury or judges will look at it, um, and they might present it at the at the festival, and then it will get audience like that, or send it to the press, and they will maybe or write write stuff about it yeah. uh, on Medium or on Gamma Sutra or any other. So yeah, so yeah, mm -hmm. I, I guess. Well, well, I'd say that often we've done that, and and a lot of times we failed at that. You know what I mean? Because we we were just two people in a room, and we didn't have. I mean, it takes. We learned over time that it takes a lot of marketing <laughs> and we had to find out what that was and you know um and the times that we've tried to do it on purpose it hasn't exactly worked it's been more about like um people were sort of drawn to our work and then getting them to talk about what we did 
you know, in a favorable light to other people, you know, and, and then, and the word sort of gradually spreading, you know, and I think that even though we had that intention of making games for people who don't play games, like, we discovered that everyone plays games, you know, and they're just lying to themselves for first, for one thing, and for another thing, uh, that it's, um, that what really needed to happen was that, that there was this sort of, P, this P, general PR problem with games in general, and so sort of like making people feel better about the idea of video games in general was a, was a good tactic to get people to realize that what we were doing was, was something that was for them. So it's like almost like you have to get rid of all the cliches. You have to stop thinking about space invaders. You can't make it, why, why is it always gonna be so freaky? Like, no, this is not a freaky activity. This is just a thing. It's like, you've got, probably got like five games on your phone. You just don't even realize you're playing them. You know what I mean? Or, or think about like, the next time you're spinning Google Earth, think about what you're doing. I mean, that's kind of an amazing thing. You've got this, the whole world, like right there in your phone and you're just spinning it, stopping on a random location and zooming in. I mean, it's like this in a way is a playful act. It's like just, you know, making people, reframing it and making them think differently about what, what this stuff is, you know? And I think that's something that Zoe's festivals, I mean, it's already as some um, festivals are doing you know, also is like just presenting a bunch of things that are like interesting to people and not saying like, oh, it's this monolithic mm. video mm. games thing, you know. The, the other really cool thing that happens with um, the Playful Arts Festival mm -hmm. um, and also the things that we do with Hover Garden here in Melbourne with mm. Andrew Brophy, um, a, lot of, a lot of the events tend to take place in, in open public spaces um, and that's a great way of engaging with people from the general public. Mm -hmm. you know, when, we, when we started Hover Garden back in 2013, um, our very first event was like in, in a garden, in a park. And then we went to the city streets and, and laneways and you know, we just brought games with us into the space. And part of that was because we wanted the general public to know about all of the, the interesting and different independent games that were being made at the time uh, to kind of um, uh, you know, tackle the, the, the stigma that, that the general public may have had about video games. Yeah, yeah it's a lot about <coughs> uh, framing it and the perception people have already of games, exactly. right? Exactly. So that's, it is difficult to get people to perceive as something that they should yeah. do or can do or uh, like Arya said, mm. like often it's like, yeah, no, but I don't play games. And then it's like, yeah, but you do play games and it's not yeah. that, that thing that like teenagers do or something it's also that you yeah. can do mm -hmm. so i would also say reach out to uh, because it's part of like curated job also to try and broaden the idea of video what video games can do but also i guess for people that make video games to you know reach out not only to video game festivals but also to other yeah. areas in the in the world there's like there is people that are interested in games but we I guess we have to reach out more to these other Mm -hmm. um, backgrounds and, and areas and there's festivals that are interested in I mean there are artist residencies you can also probably participate in if you have the right words so that's that's a thing that yeah. you need to write the right wording um, so artist residencies and also other festivals that are open for film and, and new media and, and those kind of things and you can send in your game you just have to do it mm -hmm. so it's just broaden your your own view as well uh, and don't expect people to go to you because they you have yeah. a video game sometimes. and as a creator maybe it helps sometimes to be very laser focused in what you're doing mm -hmm. and like not not worrying about like what's going on or what's fringe what's triple a whatever but just mm -hmm. have your theme and go for it you know have your idea you know yeah be an author be an artist be like you know have respect for what you're making, you know, it's like it doesn't always have to be hammered out in two days in a game jam, you know what I mean? You can make, be extremely like serious about this stuff and ambitious in your work and um, I mean often we've we had like several different kinds of projects going like um, our work sometimes would be like things that we wanted lots and lots of people to play or as many as possible as many as we could attract but then other times we were just making works that we thought should exist and this idea of making what you think should exist is like uh, an extremely important one I think um, like the, he showed the trailer for our game Sunset, that was a game that we just sort of powered through. Like we, 
There was a lot of different things, elements to that one, but I'd say it falls into the realm of games that we just felt really should exist for the ideas that we had at that moment and what we felt like the world needed or whatever. Um, but we've made games based on plays that we worked with, um, you know, motion capturing dancers. We've we've worked with other authors. We've worked with tons of musicians on original music, like and that taking them out of their comfort zone. That's another thing. Good thing. I Me mean, not to go, get too deep into this answer, but it's like that working with others is part of the game making process and that um, when you collaborate with other people this can be an important moment to like um, to learn something or to deepen your practice as a game designer or developer or whatever game artist and um, to not be like oh you're gonna make music for my game but think it's like that we are collaborating on this you know and really um, taking their practice to heart also as, as, as an part active participant in the process of making new work with you, mm. you know, and we always looked at it that way when we were collaborating with other people, be it a dancer, a writer, a musician, whatever, you know, another, um, another, we worked with 3D artists that we just cold contacted, like, we loved your work on whatever AAA game, do you want to work on our dinky little project? And they'd be like, yeah, let's do it, you know, and like, that was great. We were, had some great collaborations that way, you know. And it, just really taking those, that collab to heart, I think, is a way of attracting other people to mm -hmm. your projects. Oh. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I was interested in what Michael said before about um, the end of the utopia or something, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounded kind of cool. Um, oh, are you able to elaborate on that? Or? <laughs> I don't think he can elaborate on it. Um, what was that about again? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very Michael thing to say. I think he was uh, thinking about this uh, uh, end of the uh, utopic idea of um, of of being a game developer and self-sustaining um, in an, in a supportive environment where there is an ecosystem where you can uh, make and sell your work and where people care and uh, where I don't know did that, exactly. Did that ever exist? Or it it or kind of did. It did for like five minutes. Yes, it did. Like maybe in around 2009 or 10. Yeah, I think it was there for a second. But it, it kind of, I think uh, the end of the utopia had a lot to do with this idea that he was alluding to about um, the gatekeepers sort of uh, taking over the sort of rise of the larger games portals at first seeming like a good idea and then turning into this mini headed monster that you couldn't get away from um, as an independent developer, which turned out to be a really um, destructive, I still think it's destructive um, idea, you know, that you make your game and you're like, okay, now I've made my game, I would love to sell it and you have to sell it through Steam or whatever, you know, and you have to sell it through Steam really cheaply and you have to, like the economics of it were all turned around and they got a cut and all this other stuff and they're rich and most independent developers are not, you know what I mean? It's like, and perhaps there was this utopic moment where we all thought, well, maybe we can make this something where good people can make their projects and like, you know, sustain themselves and that sort of disappeared at a certain point. <laughs> and maybe it's true for some, but it's like, it was just, it turned into being like everything else, you know, it's like some people it works and most people it doesn't and never the two shall meet, <laughs> sort of. I, I yeah. kind of feel like um, that's, uh, I've, se I've seen that before a couple of times, and it always seems yeah. to be connected to technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like technology oh, absolutely. Gives We've us seen this it. Hope. This is the third time this has happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the second time. That was the second time. We're like, we're going so easily uh, deluded by this hope that, you know, this utopia yeah. that technology seems to, you know, put under our nose, but yeah. often, yeah, the reality is sort of a bit yeah, different. Yeah, no, it seems, it seems possible for a moment, and you can imagine a better world. And it is quickly killed by capitalism. Um, I've, I've got a, a, two other couple of random questions cause since there aren't too many, so I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> hog the mic. Um, I really, uh, really, probably it might, it might be the only game that I've played of yours, um, mm -hmm. but it was, I think it was The Forest, was it? Or was yeah, it? The Endless Forest, yeah, that's still um, going strong. <laughs> which uh, which I, th where I absolutely loved and I have remembered cool. you guys ever since. Uh, has anybody else done any kind of, any non-verbal sort of animal-like thing? Um, like that before? Um, before us, I don't know, but at now, yeah, sure. I mean, there was a, there's been a few. There's one, some really nice ones out now, actually. I mean, it, it's an interesting idea that I think um, that 
you know, there's a lot of people who love animals. <laughs> and so you want to give them a way to like into video games as well, you know? But I think at the time, I mean, it was 2005. It was a very weird thing to make in 2005, um, The Endless Forest, where everyone is playing a deer and you don't talk and there's no chat. And we were sort of playing with this idea of the, multi, the massively multiplayer game. At the time, everyone was playing World of Warcraft. And we were like, oh, well, we want, that was actually the first game that we released. Everybody wants to make a multiplayer game. We actually just did it. <laughs> Which is, we look back and we're like, that was crazy. What were you thinking? <laughs> you know, but... Um, we found a way to make it and we made it. And um, yeah, and so the nonverbal aspect of it was extremely important. And I think it's something that people have played a lot more with now. I mean, um, but I in, in that sort of networked, because I, I found it really alien to, like, mm -hmm. it was tapping into something really sort of animalistic and yeah, really sort of yeah. alien, like this whole <laughs> idea of communicating with another person. Because you knew there was another person behind, right, like, right. Yeah, the avatar. Yeah, yeah. But you're using, like, animal it's all cues people to, playing animals. to communicate. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't actually, yeah, I don't know if I've seen anything like that since. Yeah, I, I mean, think yeah, it was Yeah, there were plenty of games with animals and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the Light and Delights game that mm. they made. Oh, um, I'm sorry, guys, if you're watching that I forgot the name of your game. But it's really beautiful. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I think that people, at the time, our, our onus or our, our, our sort of trigger was that people were going into these massively multiplayer games and they weren't really playing the, the character. They weren't really role playing. It's like, and and um, there was a lot of harassment or people being mean or being stupid or whatever. And we were just like, well, why don't you just not let them communicate like that and see what happens? Let's make a game where you can't harass each other or it's really difficult. You know, people have tried. There's been entire campaigns where like entire forums have showed up in the endless forest and tried to like find a way to like grief each other or something, and it's just not possible. And you'd see all these frustrated threads. You know, she just laughed at me and started dancing. You know. It's <laughs> like, like, you know, and, and um, so that that game design was a success, I think. Um, <laughs> at any rate, um, I'm very bad at wording questions. Um, but uh, so, when you're applying for a lot of uh, artist grants uh, for a lot of games and whatnot, how? So this is, uh, on, I guess, intersection of photography, where it's like you can apply for these grants, but you kind of have to tailor your work around what the people want to see. How do you mm. tailor that for a lot of like art grants? Do you? Oh, art grants are weird. You can find all kinds of art grants. <laughs> you have to work at it like everything else. I mean, we, we applied and applied and applied and we, we got some, you win some, you lose some kind of, yeah. Um, and uh, we had to work at, um, like the arts funding system in Belgium was through the um, same fund as the film fund. And so we had to basically teach them about games and then say, yeah, but we're not making that. We're making this kind of game, you know, and, and it was a real education process. With photography, of course, that's going to be much harder, <laughs> you know, because it's like photography is a much bigger medium in a, in a sense, you know. It's like you can't redefine photography that well. At least I don't know. I don't think so. It's harder, you know, in a sense. But with video games, we were sort of, sort of trying to break something open the whole time. And so it was like a really difficult process of education of the funders, in a sense, and getting them used to this idea. I mean, a lot of what I'd say a lot of what Michael and I have done over the years has also been an educational mission to sort of say, not only for ourselves, but for other developers, that there should be a place within arts and culture for your work. And we've worked to, we've written so many things, so we've, we've talked to so many different organizations and given talks to publicly and privately and everything, just to sort of make this idea something that could happen, you know. Mainly for ourselves, but we were very happy when other people joined in and were like, yes, exactly, this is exactly what we're talking about. And I think that that eventually made a, lo a change in the larger games culture as well, um, not only uh, by us speaking out, but through our speaking out and taking the blows sometimes, like giving other people the power to do the same thing. And that was very important. So I would say that you just, if you're trying to do something differently, that just realize that it's going to take a lot of... Um, advocacy on your part and finding sort of champions in other people and other people it's often it, if you can find other people who have similar desires if you can sort of band together in a way and, and make a point of it and but by no means stay silent I'd say uh, it's been very important 
that, you know, even, I'm not the kind of, even though I talk a lot, I'm not the kind of person who likes to like stand up and be like, no, this is what I'm doing, you know what I mean? I just like to be there making things. I don't really, you know, I used to always say that to Michael, I just want to make pretty pictures. I don't want to like, talk about this, <laughs> you know, but I'd say that with, if we hadn't um, been so outspoken, that um, it wouldn't have been possible to have made the games that we made at all. Like it had to be us up in the middle of some festival saying something weird and, you know, taking the heat for it later or being praised for it later, depending on the situation. You know, that's the only way that anything could happen. So with, in any art form, it's important to speak about your work and, and um, therefore communicate to, ultimately you're talking to the funders, the, that residency, that gallery, you know, so. We have time for one more question. Hi, thanks so much hey. uh, for the panel. It's been great, I'm sure you're jet lagged. Um, so uh, this is, I guess, mostly for Zareda, um, but I'm super interested in all of your opinions. But um, when we were seeing all the videos, there's a lot of, I guess, you know, games that have their origins in, um, in Europe, particularly, you know, a lot of places like Copenhagen. I'm just wondering if you see like a particularly sort of regional flavor of game development that's maybe had an influence globally. Uh, that's such a difficult question. I, because I go to different, I, you would think if you go to different places, you would sense a difference in mm -hmm. things, but I guess because it's a worldwide phenomenon and we have access uh, via all these channels that we can see what's happening and that it uh, people are inspired by different communities like um, uh, Chad was talking about the Kokoromi which is a Canadian collective and then uh, like Wild Rumpers was inspired by by them doing some things then they took it to uh, to London and do it there but then they also took it back over the ocean to San Francisco and then other people in other kind in other parts of the world were inspired by that, and this is mo mostly Western um, um, Western culture. I'm talking about now, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see the inspiration in, in in different things in community events at least uh, that people are doing, and then also game jams also, uh, like help as well. And then you have like. Uh, Global Game Jams and Luden Darius and all these different kind of communities that spring up mm -hmm. from those different kind of things. But so I really have a hard time seeing. But I like Copenhagen Game Collective is is I think very inspirational to a lot of different kinds of people in different kinds of worlds and also that the community members spread out over the world. There's a couple of them here now in Melbourne. And then uh, there's uh, one, there's a couple in, in like Montreal. So they also bring that back to uh, different places. Um, yeah, so I guess everyone is inspired by everyone basically and then yeah. bringing it and then make a sort of like a, a twist on it for their communities, obviously, because you need to you need to find the community and then fit it in that into that community, um, and like <coughs> yeah. So I'm trying to think about the Netherlands right now, where I'm from, and there is not really an alternative game collect co game thing collective. I mean, alternative control is collective. That's not really there. But then they have a lot of different kinds of like li younger people that are now like doing interesting things. Um, being inspired by <laughs> others from like 2008 or something. So that's yeah. really interesting. So it's basically all inspiration from uh, from this worldwide community, which is which I think is interesting. And I'm going to talk about it more in my keynote as well to show you what's been happening around Europe mostly. Yeah. Cool. That brings us to the end of the session. Great. And we would like to thank you all for attending tonight's Acme Conversations event. Can I please get you to put your hands for together for Chad Toprak, Ori Harvey, Zareta Bader, Buta, and Michael Salmon. Yeah.